Philosophy 2, DE, Lecture 2 on Kantian Ethics, The Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, Section 2, Freedom, Morality, and Universal Laws. Section 2, Introduction. So far, I hope that our discussion has been relatively easy to follow. The distinction between doing things because they are right and doing the right thing because we enjoy doing that specific thing is relatively clear. In the second section of the groundwork, the discussion becomes very complex. Here is where Kant lays out the details of what he understands the good will to be. We have seen that a good will cannot be just something like compassion or sympathy. Those are emotions. If I act just because the suffering of others makes me sad and I want to fix it, then I am helping others simply because I want to and not just because it is the right thing to do. So how do I figure out what is the right thing to do? Put differently, if to be good means to have a good will, and a good will is a desire to do what is right, what does the good will want to do? What must I be desiring and trying to do in the world if I am to be considered good? Here Kant's discussion becomes very abstract. The moral law must be universalized. As Kant puts it, quote, unless we deny that the notion of morality has any truth or reference to any possible object, we must admit that its law must be valid, not merely for men, but for all rational creatures generally, not merely under certain contingent conditions or with exceptions but with absolute necessity. For duty, if it is to be practical, unconditional necessity of action must hold for all rational beings, and for this reason it must also be a law for all human wills. Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, Section 2. Kant begins the second section with a claim that whatever the moral law is, it must be universalized. Kant believes that explanation of any kind can only come through universal laws. This is true in the two central domains of knowledge, explanation of the physical world and explanation of our duty. Kant begins by discussing causation in the physical world. Causation in the physical world with physical laws. Why do things happen in the physical world in the way that they do? After the time of Isaac Newton, it became clear that events in the physical world could be explained by physical laws. Objects near the Earth fall at 9.8 meters per second per second because of the law of gravity. When one object hits another object, that object will move away as a function of the mass, momentum, elasticity, and angle of impact of the impacting object. Causation in the physical world happens because of physical laws, and hence the world is explained according to universal laws of nature. Kant believed that causation could only be explained if there were universal laws behind events. An example of no explanation or causation without laws. Imagine, for example, that there is no universal law of gravitational attraction. Imagine that objects of the same mass that were dropped near the Earth would sometimes fall to the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared, sometimes fly up into the sky, 
sometimes travel parallel to the ground, and sometimes bounce up and down perpendicular to the sky. In a world like this, with no law of gravity, and where no further laws, such as laws of propulsion, could explain why objects behaved in this strange way, would there even be such a thing as causation or explanation for why the object I dropped near the earth had fallen to the ground? We explain the fact that the apple fell to the ground by saying that all objects near the earth fall to the ground because gravity acts upon them. But in a world where things that were dropped only sometimes fell to the ground, we would no longer have an explanation for why this particular object fell. As a result, Kant believes we would not really have causation. We can't really say that anything caused it if there is not a law which applies without exception that explains the event. And so we would just say that the event happened and not that it was caused. Why Universal Laws of Nature Actually Threaten Morality to Some Philosophers Do you see anything in our description of laws of nature that might threaten the very idea of human morality? Did you notice that we said that according to the laws of nature, all objects follow laws of nature without exception, and that the activity of all physical objects could be explained by those laws? Can you see why that might be a problem for morality? The problem is this. Human bodies are physical things, and hence are subject to physical laws. But that seems to imply that the movement of all human bodies can be explained fully by talking about laws of nature. An example of the threat. If I raise my hand at my desk where I am typing this lecture, from my point of view, I did it because I wanted to. I did it from my choice, and my choice was the cause of my action. I also could have chosen not to do that action. But the story of Newton's physical laws seems to threaten my ability to explain my behavior in that way. From the point of view of scientific physical laws, it was the laws of nature and physical causation which explain why I raised my hand. From a contemporary scientific perspective, we would probably talk about the neurons in the brain following the laws of physics and chemistry, mechanical electrical signals sent down my spine causing my muscle fibers to contract. But if I explain my human behaviors by talking about the laws of physics and chemistry, how can I also say that I chose those behaviors? The laws of physics and chemistry never have exceptions. So the firing of my neurons and the contraction of my muscle fibers followed the laws of physics based on the previous state of my neurophysical makeup. If so, then how could I have done otherwise? What then is the point of ethics? If all human action is just what we had to do because the laws of physics and our physical makeup determined it. Kant's solution to the problem. Moral causation follows different laws. Kant's solution to the problem admits everything that has so far been laid out here about the nature of causation and the nature of physical laws. Kant agrees that causation can only happen where actions fall under universal laws, but he believes that there are some kinds of causation that fall under laws that are not physical but moral laws. He believes that we are immediately aware of another kind of law, the moral law, and that actions that fall 
under the moral law also give a kind of explanation of human events. But unlike explaining our behavior using physical laws, explaining our behavior using moral laws does not imply that we have no freedom. In fact, for Kant, it implies just the opposite. For Kant, because we choose to follow the moral law, and we choose the law itself, the only time we are free is when we follow the moral law. When we are not following the moral law, the principles of human psychology determine everything that we will do. Here is how Kant puts it in the groundwork. Quote, Everything in nature works according to laws. Rational beings alone have the faculty of acting according to the conception of laws, that is, according to principles, that is, have a free will. Acting morally is the same as acting freely. If we have followed Kant this far, and I know this has not been easy to do, we will be ready to admit that all causation and explanation follows universal laws. The only time events can be explained is by saying that actions of some type will always occur in the same way because they follow a universal law. Kant believes this is the same both for events in the physical world and for events in the moral world. If an object falls to the ground near the earth, I can say it fell because of the law of gravity. In a similar way, if it is a moral fact that I should tell my neighbor the truth about breaking his window, then I can only explain the morality of this act by saying that there is a moral law which says that lying is bad. If I tell the truth because of the moral law, then I tell the truth by choice. On the other hand, if the moral law does not determine my act to tell the truth, then my action is simply determined by the physical and scientific laws of nature that govern all events in the physical world. Put simply, in this case I allow my physical, animal passions and desires to determine what I would do, rather than making a choice for myself. And for Kant, this is not a form of freedom. As we saw, Kant will say that there are only two systems of explanation which explain my action. Either that action fell under the universal laws of physical nature or under the universal laws of choice. Those actions which fall under the universal law of ethics are free because we choose the actions and we choose the laws themselves. Why is following our desires not an example of freedom for Kant? As said previously, Kant believes that all causation and explanation involve laws. But the laws of ethics are ones that we choose to follow. You don't choose to follow the laws of physics. They just happen to us and happen in our world. Kant believes that we also don't choose actions that follow from our passions. Our passions for Kant are part of our animal nature and as such are themselves part of the system of nature following natural scientific laws. Put another way, if we follow our passions, we are just acting in the ways that the laws of psychology determine our strongest desire will push us. The explanation for why I choose something from desire will always be simply, I chose that because my desire for it was stronger than my desire for some other thing. But for Kant, that is not really choice because we don't choose our desires and so we are simply being controlled by forces that we have no control over. For Kant, that is not an example of freedom, but is an example of the scientific, in this case psychological, laws controlling what we do.
why is following the moral law not an example of being determined instead of being free? For Kant, following the moral law is an example of freedom because it breaks with the natural causes that otherwise determine our actions. I cannot determine which desire is stronger in me. That is just a fact that I find present in me and that is outside of my control. But I can decide to act on the moral law instead of the laws of nature and desire. And when I do that, I am the one who determines my action. Because there is a law governing my behavior, I can still say that my action was caused and has an explanation, but that explanation is no longer outside of me. That explanation is my choice to conform my action to the moral law. Why is following the moral law an example of freedom? To clarify a bit more, following the moral law is an example of freedom because in the case of the moral law, I choose the law myself. I choose the moral law because I choose to act from a principle of rationality and morality instead of letting my physical nature and emotions determine how I will act. But it is not true freedom unless I choose the law guiding my behavior as well as choose the action. This means that the moral law must be something that I have chosen. In fact, Kant thinks that the moral law is built out of the very idea of what it means to choose or decide, combined with the idea that my choice must follow a universal law. So the basic form of the moral law for Kant is this. The moral law is the law which comes out of the very idea of choosing according to universal principles. There is a good chance that this final statement does not yet make sense for us. In our next lecture, we will discuss how ethics is a matter of making our choices according to universal laws. This ends Lecture 2 on Kantian Ethics.